cooperation with these efforts gsfc university is organizing this webinar series career striker the aim is to introduce students with the newly emerging fields in the area of study so uh, today's uh, topic of the webinar is uh, bioinformatics and this is the second session of this webinar series so not taking uh, much of your time let me introduce the speaker of today's session dr saroj shekhawat Dr. Saroj Shikhawat presently she is a assistant professor of biotechnology and also holding the position of CEO of Gitar that is GSFC University Innovation Incubation and Technology Applied Research Center. Dr. Saroj has done her PhD and postdoctoral studies from Weizmann Institute of Science Israel and also has immense experience of working at various eminent institutes such as nari that is national aids research institute at pune ferguson college pune and many more her areas of research are drug discovery biosimilars genomics and personalized medicine so we welcome you ma'am here and uh, session is all yours ma'am now thank you so much dipika so thank you so much uh, uh, Before I start with that, I will start uh, presenting the uh, screen to the audience so that we have all systems go. Uh, I would request all the participants to mute their mic. So that. Uh, Um, everything uh, the speaker is audible to everyone right so is my screen available to i mean can you can you see this screen uh, yes ma'am just not the presentation, the presentation. yeah now uh, it is all right. it is visible all right. right yes all right, all right. So let me just uh, yeah. Let me just uh, start with this. Start with this. Deepika, ma'am, we uh, you can see the presentation. Yes, yes, ma'am. It is visible. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to the students and parents who are attending this webinar today on bioinformatics. Bioinformatics has been defined as the 21st century bioscience, and today, what I am going to, as a part of biotechnology, uh, I am sure all of you are aware of, that we have a uh, masters and graduate courses in biotechnology at gsfc university and bioinformatics as as kind of an accumulation or plethora of many different kind of techniques and bioinformatics is one of the portion of biotechnology and this portion has become such an important integral portion that as it has been defined as the 21st century bioscience so before i go into discussing about bioinformatics what i would like to talk to you about that although biology as a science is at the crux of human existence and survival but biology as a so through my lecture today i would try to convince you that biology was biology is and biology would always be a science that would stay at the center stage till the world actually comes to an end and to support this statement i would ask you all to reflect on the current covid-19 pandemic that has shut factories that has crushed the economies that has brought everything down to its knees but the only thing that is surviving is the biology and when the whole world is now in a overdrive to find the cure or to curb the spread of the corona virus so mind you when i tell you that pharmaceutical industries the medical profession anything that is linked to the biology is always going to be there till you have life on earth because till you have life on earth there are going to be diseases there are going to be pandemics and 
that's not solely the reason that one should study biology. And I'll take you to the next statement that, so apart from this, uh, you know, I would say the necessities of understanding biology and studying biology, there is an incentive, additional incentive to study biology. And in the words of uh, a Stanford professor, Dr. Donald Noth, it says that biology easily has 500 years of exciting problems to work upon. So as I said, biology in itself, because of its necessity, becomes a science that everybody should understand. But for those people who are in this field, they know that there are so many different aspects of it and interesting aspects of it that a person could work upon and would keep the person engaged for years to come. So today I introduce you to a new frontier in biology that is bioinformatics that has changed the way the science is looked at. And this particular frontier has opened up so many infinite thrilling opportunities and areas for people to work on. So when I talk to, uh, this talk is going to cover, uh, so give you a brief idea about what bioinformatics is. Then we are going to cover what bioinformatics allows us to do. Then we discuss what would be the future of bioinformatics and what would be the future in bioinformatics for students who actually study this field. And then we discuss the magical combination of bioinformatics with artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let's just start with what is bioinformatics. Bioinformatics, if you go by the, uh, you know, they have different definitions, but if you go by the most common definition, which is given by the National Center for Biotechnology Information, USA, bioinformatics is a field of science in which biology, computer science, and information, they merge to form a single discipline. However, you can have a very simplified definition of bioinformatics that it is a computational branch of molecular biology, or it can also be called a in silico biology. So when you have to understand biology uh, and bioinformatics, you will have to do a little bit of time travel because bioinformatics, as uh, you would understand, has not been a field that was there for forever. This field has come quite recently into the foray, but to understand it, it, it has its basis in the basic science that has been existing for almost 150 years now. I would request you all to not try very hard to look at the screen and try to read the timeline, because what I'm trying to cover is 150 years of uh, you know, data into the screen. So I understand that it would be very hard for you to see and read the data. So I'm just going to take you over those milestone uh, you know, discoveries that set up a stage for bioinformatics. So you had Austrian monk with the name of Mendel, Gregor Mendel, who while working in his garden realized, and he was working with the peas in his garden, and realized that there is something that gets transferred from one generation to another generation. So there is something which a parents pass on to the offspring, and from the offspring, it goes to the next generation. Now, what that something was, was something which people could not find out for another 60 or 75 years, till there was another experiment done a very simple famous experiment which is labeled as the most critical and uh, you know simplest experiment done ever which showed that this uh, 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 you know this something that he called it the something some principle that is moving from generation to generation is a nucleic acid which is present in the nucleus of a cell and this nucleic acid was called dna or deoxyribose nucleic acid and then became the work on because people realized the importance of this nucleic acid when they realized that it is this DNA that is calling uh, this that is calling the shot in your life. You know that is what is deciding how you are going to look, how is your generation going to look, what kind of traits you would process. So it became kind of a focal point of all the research to understand that what exactly is this molecule. And of course, the later work were all about solving the structure of this DNA molecule. Then along with the solving of the structure of DNA molecule, 
uh, Harvin Karana, Argovin Karana also found out about the genetic code. And I'm just going to go over this because for people who are not from uh, biology, this would anyway be like, you know, words which would not make sense. And those who are uh, joining my, me from biology would always have this, already have this information. So I'm just putting it across that once you identify this molecule, the science field grew and you came to a stage where you could actually, so you by now had uh, deciphered or found out the structure of DNA. And you know that the DNA is made up of only four nucleotides. So this whole molecule that is carrying the information of exactly what you will be, it is defining your character, it is defining your looks, it is defining your complete genotype, it is also defining your future generations, is nothing but a simple molecule that is made up of four nucleotides, A, T, G, and C. And it is these four nucleotides that are repeatedly arranged in a sequential manner that makes the complete genome of an organism. And this is where the next important milestone experiment showed that it is possible to read these sequences. One can find out in an organism what is the arrangement of these sequences. And there came the another new technology that is DNA sequencing. So you could read those sequencing and you could find out in what particular order these sequences were arranged. And once this basic discovery was made, of course, everybody started to run to find out the sequences of whatever took their fancy. So people would find out the sequence of any organism that they are working on. So simplest of organisms like bacteria, you would have yeast, you would have flies, in which you will try to identify the sequences. And what you're doing now is you are kind of making sense of the data. So now this is the central point. So this was 1900s, was the era of, I would say the golden era of science, where all major uh, discoveries and technologies were developed. So in 1977, sorry. So in 1977, mental data set, that is the molecular sequence. So once you found out the molecular sequence, so of course, uh, the, so till this age from 1982 till 2003, although advances are being made, things are still moving very slowly. Why moving very slowly? Because you don't have any other way of studying these uh, sequences. So what you're doing is you're using a chemical to tell you the sequence of the data. And once the sequence is there, you're actually trying to manually put this sequence together. So you're arranging these alphabets manually one after the other. And of course, I'm talking about, so it's not just you are putting some hundred words together or two hundred words together. You are put, putting some, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of words together. And mind you, just arranging them one after the other is not enough. You also have to arrange it in an order that they exist, because in that order lies the information. So of course, manually doing it, annotating it, arranging it sequentially was a Herculean task. And of course, the science moved very slowly. So till from 1977, there has been slow and steady rise in the sequencing data, which was again a blessing in disguise, because the computers which could you know, arrange this data and which could analyze this data had not been developed. So what you were doing were you were writing it on the piece of paper, you were kind of sticking those piece of papers on the laboratories, and you're trying to make sense of it. So it is basically what you're doing is you're doing, moving these pieces of paper around and doing an optical arrangement, an optical, uh, you know, alignment. And in today's term, I'm sure like there are people from computational biology, that is something which was called the pattern matching. So what the computer does through computational method, people were trying to do it with the manual thing. And of course, there was a very slow uh, progress made into that. So because of that, what happens is the technological development now started happening in this field. People realized that there has to be a faster way of generating these sequences. Then you would need the space to store all this information. 
So this technical technological development in the field of sequencing machines, where you find out the sequence of A, T, G, and C, which are arranged in a particular manner, was taken up, and then you had this very ambitious project. Um, just moving forward in timeline, and you reach a stage in 1990 where now you have a modest amount of technology and understanding. So you have now, uh, you know, a month to read just 100 base pair of data, which can probably read the data in let's say few hours and give you 1,000 base pair of aligned data or sequence data in probably 10 to 15 minutes. And because of this, uh, you know, a, a, a decision was made that let us sequence our complete genome. So this, uh, you know, project, this uh, huge project was taken up that we would sequence a human genome. We will find out how this data is arranged in a human genome. And this stretched on from 1990 to 2003. And once again, if we have to do the same thing now. This would be done probably in an hour or two hour, which took these people almost 13 years. And in 2003, a finished version of the human genome sequence was shared with the whole world that shows how our DNA is made up of different kinds of nucleotides and what are the sequence of these nucleotides. So all these computational methods were possible because you could now develop or you could now use the supercomputers, supercomputers, which would have a very high super processing power. They're working with 34 trillion floating point of operation. They're working with 3.12 million processing cores. And they have a data storage system that can move or that can hold around 40 petabytes of data with a transfer rate of one terabyte per second. That is how far these supercomputers are. And that is what made possible sequencing of these genomes. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share it with you in the next slides, why you needed some supercomputers to do that. So this was the era and this was the birth of bioinformatics when you had technologies to sequence the genome and you had the data that was generated from this sequencing. Now, what does bioinformatics allows you to do? To understand what bioinformatics allows you to do, we have, we'll do a little bit of zooming in. We are going to move now from an organism to a molecular level. So basically what I'm trying to do is you can think of breaking yourself into a smaller part till you actually reach a part uh, you know, where you cannot break yourself anymore. And this is what precisely we are going to do. So you have an organism, let's say in this instance, we are looking at a cow. We all know this basic biology everybody has studied, that cows, you have different organs inside a cow. Each organ is made up of a tissue, and each tissue is made up of cells. So cells are the structural and functional unit of life, and within these cells exist many different kind of, if you can see here, there are many different kind of organelles within a cell, and these organelles are all carrying out their function with the help of a molecule, which looks like that. So every cell that we are looking at, each cell that we are looking at would have a DNA. So there are all the cells with DNA, and this is this DNA that is going to have a blueprint of all the proteins. So this is a, 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 you know, a molecule that is carrying the information of how many different kind of proteins or what kind of proteins are going to be made by the cell because these proteins are the ones which are in going to turn going to determine so it is the shape and the function of these proteins which in turn is going to decide the shape and the function of the cell and the organelles and ultimately it is going to be the the cell which is going to determine the function of the tissue organism and the uh, uh, and until the organism so basically it is the cell which is now regulating the functions upwards so once you have this understanding this 
something in biology uh, which is called the central dogma central dogma talks about the flow of information in biological system now in a biological system the information flows in only one direction and of course there is one exceptions which for the current purpose we are not going to discuss but in general this information is transferred to rna now here pay attention that you have dna and as i mentioned before the dna has only four nucleotides t a c and g it is this t a c and g which would be arranged in a particular order that is going to decide your blueprint now when the dna converts into rna you can see that they are speaking the same language it is the same language of these four nucleotides with the only difference being that in rna the t has been changed to a u apart from that all the three nucleotides stay the same so a nucleotide information gets transcribed into a new nucle another nucleotide information now the second transfer of information or the second direction of flow of information changes a little bit because from rna now you are moving to the amino acid level and here the information changes its pattern how does it change its pattern that now that information is not going to be read one is to one is to one this information is now read in triplets and this is what is called your code it is these triple letters forming one single amino acid is what is your code is your blueprint and that is what decides what kind of a genetic yeah. makeup or what kind of organism you would be so all these triplets uh, of the letters all of them each one of them code for a single amino acid so if you have aug you have one kind of amino acid with cgg another and so on and so forth so these amino acids have an annotation so you represent each amino acid with a single letter so you have aug which is a methionine represented by an m arginine and tyrosine so if you see here this is what exactly is your gene because your gene now has a defined starting point and a defined end point so anything that is going to be made by your dna will start at this point and is going to end at this point so aug is a start codon which tells a gene where to start and uga uaa or ug uag are the codons which are called the stop codons because that is where the translation stop so this entire length and i am just showing you a very small length believe me you don't have proteins which are this small this is just for the purpose of this study that i show you so now you can see that this is central dogma which decides the flow of information and this flow of information is what is being used in bioinformatics so what you have been able to do is you have been able to make advances in dna sequencing machines so you have been able to develop machines with better computational property you have been able to make machines which are faster which have faster processing and you have coupled it with your not just with your human genome but with many other various kind of genome project and which all ties up to what is now known as bioinformatics so how do you move forward so this computational success has been able to make changes for you and they have given you what is known as genome assemblies they have been able to give you what is known as the gene discovery so you can discover the genes within a genome and because of this computational successes you have been able to now predict a protein structure from the sequence that you have been able to take out because of the dna sequencing so now <clears throat> look at so i'm just going to take this example to understand how bioinformatics work i told you that bioinformatics is nothing but sequencing and genome but what about sequencing genome i mean just having a term sequencing and genome does not mean that you have any said that we have been able to have entire uh, you know genome of a human being what did it mean it meant this so what you see here a very beautiful pattern is nothing but your chromosomes and 
all of your DNA is arranged in this 23 pair of chromosomes that we all have. So you have chromosomes, so you have 1 to 22 autosomes, and then you have one sex chromosome. And these barcodes that you see here are the barcodes for many different kind of genes which are present in particular chromosomes. And this entire set is your genome. So this single line is a gene, and one gene is one which, call, which is coding for a protein. So what do you call a gene? Gene is that sequence of DNA that is going to be translated and going to make a protein. So you can see the arrangement of these genes and you can now probably appreciate that how we have been able to achieve this feat where we have been able to not only know that what is our entire sequence, but we have also been able to place many of the genes to their right location. So we know that location of particular gene, let's say A, is in a chromosome 10. If we have to look at the location of particular gene, let's say number seven, it is on chromosome number five. So gene mapping and gene sequencing through experimental uh, you know, biology has now able to do this mapping of the chromosome. And what did human genome give us? This is what it gave us, that our genome is made up of a sequence of three billion letters. So yes, this is the expression, I think, which would, uh, you know, be the right expression that this is how big our genome is. And even now, if you have not been able to probably understand the extent of or these three billion letters in form of a book, you will be actually creating 100 huge books of close printing. You can see how closely the letters are arranged. So you would have 100 volumes or 100 of these huge books just writing these nucleotide sequences, which is of your gene. So is that enough? We have been able to map our genome. We have been able to get the sequences of the genome. Now, where is the bio bioinformatics coming? So when you look at this, when you're looking at this, you know, I'm just bringing a close up of this. So I have out of thousands and thousands of genes which are there in those chromosomes, I have just taken out one small protein and the gene of that protein, which is around 25,000 base pair. Now just see how many, and because of the constraint of the page, I could not put the entire uh, sequence. This is just one fourth of the sequence. So imagine four times this sequence is just one protein and you have somewhere around 30,000 proteins which are being made in your cell. So this should give you the extent of information that we have generated. And that is why we have huge data banks with that information just lying there for somebody to read and make sense of. So now when I look at this information to a layman, if I just ask somebody to like look at this information and tell me uh, you know where is a gene in this information i don't think any one of us would be able to find out or a biologist probably will be able to find out because as i said a gene would always start with aug and the gene would always end with uaa or the other two stop codon so now imagine if you have to find out that aug codon in this sequence manually of course, it is going to be once again a tedious and a Herculean. That it would look for those patterns where it would read this entire sequence and then it will give you the pop ups where this. So, in this case, as you can see here, that it gives me a pop up here that there is one gene which is starting from this place. So, before this place, all this data was a non-coding sequence of DNA. It did not code for any protein. It was just a sequence which was there in our genome, which may have some other function which we do not know of, but a coding or a protein forming gene is starting somewhere here and probably would end somewhere after this. So what is the limitation? The limitation and where we, uh, as I said, we need computational programs is that at a given time, any sequencing program 
can read only 1000 characters from a random place so that means that this 3 billion letters have to be broken down into 1000 1000 uh, base pair fragments and you can imagine how many fragments you would have generated so now you're reading those fragments are finding out the sequence of those fragments once you find out the sequence of those fragments mind you you also have to now put these fragments together so that they make sense so going back if i go and if i start with these 1000 fragments here then the second thousand the computer or the sequencing machine is not going in an order so it can read this one first this year second this year third this year fifth and it is giving you the sequence of thousand but those sequences are not arranged in a particular order so once again the complexity arises and think of it as a storybook so if i have the storybook and that storybook is written in the uh, you know form of nucleotides now when i do sequencing all these sequences or all these lines of paragraphs have changed because the sequencing machine has read this 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 so now I have this information, but I don't know how to arrange this information so that it would make sense. And once again, that is where you would need algorithms. You would need algorithms to piece this story together so that you would have a meaningful uh, analysis, you would have meaningful interpretation, and now you have your story. And that is what is going to be happening in the field of sequencing. So as I explained it to you, that it is a big jigsaw puzzle. Each of these pieces is like, you know, a thousand base pair pieces. So you are getting this thousand base pair sequences. And now the idea is that you put this part, unlike the jigsaw puzzles in real life, where you may have maximum 300, 400, or 500 pieces. In real life, in genome sequencing, you are working with a jigsaw puzzle with the 35 million pieces which you have to piece together. And once again, as I said, it is only possible through a marriage between biology, computation, com uh, com computers, and information technology. So what have been we able to generate? We have been able to generate something which is called omics in bioinformatics. So you have now a data, which is a genetic data, which is a data based on your DNA sequence, which is called genomics. So that has an entire nucleotide sequence. Then you have, you, as I showed you before, that the entire nucleotide sequence is not what is making the proteins. The protein information is uh, residing only in the genes, and you have very few genes which are encoding for proteins. So now you have to only, if you want to read only those transcripts which are going to make protein, so you would need the sequence of your messenger RNA, which is the messenger RNA, which is translating into proteins. And you have another omics, which is called the transcriptomics, so which gives you only the messenger RNA sequencing data. And then you move on to proteomics, because now you also have proteins with the sequence of amino acids arranged in a string. And all these sequences are going to tell you how a particular protein is going to be folded. And then, of course, you have metabolomics because these proteins have functions. And this would be the function. So many different proteins having many different interactive crossover pathways where a single protein can be part of multiple pathways and multiple pathways can converge on a single pathway or they can branch off at any point. And that makes a part of metabolomics. And tying all four of them together is what we have systems biology because system biology is now working upwards towards a system that is at an organismic level, how these four different fields tie up together to create and work at an organismic level. So to show you the extent of data and to show you the extent of opportunities that are available for students who are, generate, uh, who are going to be studying bioinformatics is that you have sequence the genomes of animals, plants, fungi, archaea, and bacteria, and you can see the growth of gene bank. So this is how the data has accumulated over a course of 20 to 30 years. 
So initially, you had a very less data, but suddenly from 1999 onwards, where you developed better computational approaches, where you had a, uh, you know, better, faster machines for sequencing, the data has seen an exponential rise. And also the number of users who are studying this data has also increased exponentially. So there lies a potential for students who have an interest in understanding these patterns and in understanding these sequences and uh, doing some kind of pattern matching or inferences, you have a huge potential because the information I'm just showing you different, uh, you know, sequences of, you know, uh, Arabidopsis plant, yeast, honeybee, you have a marsupial, you have marmoset, cows, dogs, uh, you know, drosophila and horses, which have been sequenced. And this is just a representative figure. We have probably sequenced more than thousands and thousands and thousands of organisms. And we are storing all the data in a vault. And that vault is open to everybody who wants to access the data and study. So that is one open vault which is open to anybody who wants to just take out any gene and study it and make any kind of uh, you know, contribution to the field of biology. When we talk about bioinformatics in sequences, as I have been showing you that you need computers to arrange these sequences, but you do not need them only to do that. You also need computers to understand what is the meaning in these sequences and the meaning is hidden in the genes. So you need the computer to show you that in that complete sequence, where is the genes encoded? Where are and how are these genes turned on or turned off? When does a cell know that this particular gene needs to be switched on or this particular gene needs to be switched off? And also, how does this genetic data kind of links to your looks, to the observed trait? So how is it a particular sequence of nucleotides in a DNA tells somebody or shows that somebody would be tall or somebody would be short, somebody would have blue eyes, somebody would have black eyes. How do you tie it all together? So that is the hidden data which you could make. Hello? Hello? All right. So I continue. Yes, so call you. So what you're trying to find is a gene and you're trying to find this gene in 3 billion letters. So of course, there has to be an approach. And what is the approach? The approach is through bioinformatics. What you can do is you can do sequence alignment. If you're looking for a particular kind of a gene, what you do is if you have some sequence of nucleotides of your genome, you know that there's a gene bank of many different organisms. So you found out the sequence, but you don't know what this sequence stands for. So the thing what you do with it, that you go, put it in, uh, you know, the, I would say the software, open software that has been created, the source uh, that has been created by NCPI, where you can find out the sequence of many different organisms. So you put your genetic information or your nucleotide sequence into that, and you carry out a blast, or you carry out a sequence alignment and you see how many different kind of organism is this sequence of mind similar to. When you see the similarity, you try to find out that, okay, fine, my sequence matches with the sequence of, let's say, a reptile. Now, if it matches with the sequence of a particular region in reptile, is there a known function? For so if you find out this, this yes, this known uh, function of this reptile, gene is that it is a very important gene in one of the metabolic pathway. So let's say it is a glucose 6-hexokinase. So then you know that if this is an enzyme which is encoded by the snake gene, that means that my sequence can also have similar functions. So this would be one of the approach. The another approach would be that you can, uh, so this is the website uh, that you can go to. NCBI and NLH government, if the time permits, I'll show you at the end of the lecture. So now here, what you're doing is you are just doing a rough sequence similarity. So you would need to search for strings really fast. And here you would allow them some errors because you want this data to come out to you really fast. And that is where you will have to matching this kind of a 
query uh, uh, you know that you have generated then you also have the possibility as i said to look for patterns as we said we have defined genes defined genes means that it should either have a start or stop button in front of the gene at cis locations you can also have regulatory elements you could have promoters you could have uh, you know promoter binding regions so you look for those kind of signature patterns and if those signature patterns matches and if are present in your sequence then you know that you have a gene in your hand so this is uh, you know something which this wonderful alliance between computing machine learning and experimental biology has been able to achieve now let's look at the protein interpretations oh, sorry so exactly the same thing oh, okay. sorry all right uh, not going to go here so same thing you can do with the protein that you have a protein sequence and mind you that this sequence is one sequence is from tuna another sequence is from the yeast and another sequence is from the rice completely different organism and not only just organism also one of them is a plant but you can see that the protein sequence has such a high sequence overlap that you know that all of these proteins and it shows a structure here are folding into similar kind of structures so this is what can be revealed through the sequence so let's say you have a yeast sequence in which you don't know how this sequence is going to fold you just blast it into your uh, you know ncbi website uh, portal and you will see that it matches with tuna it matches with rice and it will tell you what is the function and how this protein is going to fold so you have generated a huge amount of data through genomics transcriptomics proteomics metabolomics and system biology and to add to also have generated data on people who are suffering from uh, genetic diseases which are created by either some kind of mutations and you have also added this to your data so now we have been doing arrangement of sequences we have also been doing the pattern finding in sequences but there is another aspect of bioinformatics that based on these sequences that we have put together we can also develop a phylogenetic tree that tells us how closely or distinctly related we are to other different organism and i'll give you an example of this organism that you see here it is a duckbill platypus which is a native to australia all right so now this duckbill platypus has many different kind of features if you look here it has a bill which is exactly like a duck it has a venom gland it has a nursing feature so when this uh, you know uh, uh, has uh, duckbill platypus has babies it can feed them milk but the babies are not born as babies actually it lays eggs so you see that how many different kind of traits are there in peculiar characteristic in one organism now just look at the genetic makeup of that that you have this sequence and i'm sure you cannot see the arrangement of nucleotides but you have this arrangement of nucleotides and on this nucleotides you have these so many genes which are arranged and in these genes you have genes which are helping it make milk for the babies making it produce poison and also making it lay eggs and when you do these kind of uh, you know uh, alignment studies it will show you that the milk which duckbill platypus produces it is very similar to the human mother's milk so there is a kind of connection between the genes of humans as well as the duckbill platypus if you look at the venom similar to the snake gene a uh, snake uh, venom gene if you look at the egg laying property you see that some part of egg laying has come from reptilia and the part where it feeds the baby's milk has come from human so now you see that characteristics of different organisms the print of that can be seen in our genetic makeup and based on that you can create these kind of phylogenetic trees which will tell you how you originated so you know that you originated from a one single individual and you broke down into either a kangaroo or a mouse or a bird or a snake and this is how the development unfolded 
and how have you known that this development because ultimately when you through sequencing you realize that your sequences originate from a common ancestor so you can create this phylogenetic trees and not just these bioinformatics can also be used for drug discovery diagnosis and disease management here is an example of a disease which is fredrick's ataxia and this disease is called because there is a mutation in a protein so if you look at the mutation so it affects your spinal cord a muscle and nerves and you actually are paralyzed so what happens here this is a protein which is involved in removing the iron ions from your cell now when this protein is mutated the iron ions are not removed from your cell they accumulate and they damage your nerve and muscle cells and because of this damage your spinal cord degenerates and you lose uh, the uh, you know control over your arms legs and legs and movement when you did the dna alignment study between a diseased person genome and a normal person's genome you see this patterns what you see is that in a diseased person you have these sequences which are repeated so gaa 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 so these gaa sequence they repeat from minimum 70 times till uh, around 1000 times however in a normal person you have this gaa fragment however this is a very small fragment which is only 5 to 30 times so this mutation studies or this disease studies are possible between two individuals only through bioinformatics searches where you know how a diseased individual is different from a non diseased individual and i will cover a very briefly because i think yesterday we had a like lecture from saurabh sir explaining what and how the deep learning and artificial intelligence work and here i give you the application of deep learning machine learning and artificial intelligence in protein folding applications so in general if you have to look at the structure of proteins you have to study the protein structure through nuclear magnetic resonance x ray crystallography or now latest technique the cryo e however through artificial intelligence what you can do is initially to create those kind of algorithm through artificial intelligence you can give these images for the program to create certain models which will capture the bond length or bond angles and they will now do the prediction analysis based on the data that you have fed now if you give the system a new sequence which you have not done extra crystallography on through artificial intelligence it will give you a prediction on what kind of structure that particular protein would have and these can also be done through using the neural networks because you are doing the protein product prediction and you can also use the convoluted neural networks for these kind of predictions so this is where uh, as i said many different streams of science and computers they can work together and solve a problem this a field which can now give you a precision medicine so all this while if you go to a doctor a doctor prescribes your drug which is meant for a general population the drug is not customized to your need however based on your genomic data you can be classified into so instead of uh, you know a drug which will work on 10000 people the doctor can club based on the genetic information individuals which have same kind of genetic makeup and customize a treatment for only that particular set so this is a precision medicine which will be customized only for you so that it is more effective and it can be tweaked to make more effective so that is another area of bioinformatics and lastly bioinformatics would also help you in designing the drugs and that is where the pharma industry pharmaceutical industries are investing heavily on because because of this software development and with biomedical applications you can create many different kind of predictions for drug molecules rather than going by the traditional approach where a pharmaceutical industry will screen thousands of molecules 
uh, and it's only when they bring the molecule develop the molecule do the clinical studies and bring it to the market then they realize that that molecule does not work and by then they have spent billions of dollars on their research and development so this is one area where the cost of pharmaceutical industries is released because you can do in silico or computer aid, uh, aided drug designing using the cat so this is as far as the information in bioinformatics so what kind of things can be done with bioinformatics and i have come to the last part so the careers in bioinformatics in bioinformatics you would have two kind of students so one kind of students would be the students which would have a strong computational background and these are the computer scientists and calling the scientists because if you're looking for a career in bio bioinformatics you need to either hold a masters degree or a phd degree so you have a computer scientist who has a basic knowledge of biology and is also interested in tackling the biological problems they can look for a career in bioinformatics or the second type of students who were biologists but then those are handy with the computers and they want to pursue it professionally the two both the two categories of students can look for careers in bioinformatics because bioinformatics has abundance of data and it is adding every day so this is a field as i told you in the beginning of the lecture that is never ever going to have see the end of the day and by 2015 the bioinformatics market has crossed the 50 million dollar mark so there is a growth to be in the field of bioinformatics you will need a degree you will need a working knowledge of biology and its application you would need to be proficient in some of the computer language you should have skills in data mining and you should know uh, what are the good visualize data good visualization skills you also need to have experience with bioinformatics tools such as blast molecular modeling drug design sequence analysis algorithm and clustering tools and you would also need uh, need to have an experience in using these free resources which have been developed by ucsc genome browsers you have entries you have ncbi databases and you have analysis tool and i'm sure most of the students graduate students of gsfc who are attending this lecture would understand what i'm talking about because they have been using these resources and these tools in their bioinformatics curriculum these are the recruiters uh, for bioinformatics people so these are various companies which are into the uh, you know drug designing and which are into the cure so you can look for careers in the company with strong uh, bioinformatics background to work in research institutes and universities now here comes the best part of it so if you are uh, a person who has a really good experience in bioinformatics can earn something around $100,000 annually in united states in uh, britain it comes to around 30000 pounds and an early career you can start with a salary of around 5.1 uh, lakhs per annum in uh, india so this is uh, you, know, you know that is the end of the lecture where i uh, you know give you uh, the way the bioinformatics field is the kind of options that exist for you and uh, i would end with this note that bioinformatics uh, would be relevant to you only as a specialized field only uh, in your masters or phd because you should have the basic understanding of computers and biology so a suggestion would be that first have a generic degree in the field of biotechnology biology or computer science before you try on to become a completely dedicated bioinformatician so with this i end my lecture today i'm sorry for overshooting the time uh, i thank you all for listening and i'm ready to field the questions if you all have any questions thank you ma'am thank you it was a really very uh, good good presentation giving all the insights uh, about the bioinformatics and the session is now open for the question and answer so if there are any questions either you can type it in the chat section or you can unmute to the your mic and ask the questions so uh hello ma'am uh, mil here i was having a small question i was um, um 
Could you speak a little louder because I'm not able to make uh, make out what you're saying? Hello, hello. Now is it audible? Hello. Hello. Yes, you are audible, Mithul. Just speak a little louder. Okay, okay, ma'am. Actually, ma'am, I wanted to ask that: Is it possible to uh, determine protein structure using DNA sequence uh, with bioinformatics? And if yes, then how a computer will distinguish between in an exon? Uh, once again, your question was: Is it possible to identify uh, uh, a structure in a DNA? Uh, DNA, is that the question is? And how do you distinguish between exons and introns? Uh, yes, I'm um, protein structure Hello? determination. So I'll just explain you what I have understood. See, the DNA would not make a distinction between exons and introns. So if in our DNA, if you're looking for a, a gene, you would have both the regions. If you're going to... If you want to understand which region is an exon and which region is an intron, you will also have to parallelly study the structure of messenger RNA because it's only through the transcriptome, that sequence that you have, you can work backwards and you can find out what are the regions which are transcribed and which regions have been sliced off from the DNA sequence. So, of course, it is possible you can find out which regions because the gene as it exists in the DNA is going to be much larger because it would have both genome, uh, both exon and introns. But in the messenger RNA, because the introns are sliced off, you will get only the transcript. So, you have to compare now these two sequences one next to another and see which regions have been sliced off. And of course, a prediction on the structure can, can be made because you have this computational software which will which can do the translation for you. So if you have a particular genetic uh, sequence, you can identify which kind of proteins it can make. And once again, as a biology student, you know that many different proteins can be encoded by many different amino acid sequence. So through computational biology, you will get this many options of proteins that would be made. And of course, you will have to, through experimental biology, now substantiate this study and you have to come to the conclusion. So basic information will come from the comparison, but experimentally, you will have to prove that information. I hope I understood your question and I've explained it. Mithul? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. All right. Are there any other questions? Doesn't seem so. So I hope, uh, like, you know, I mean, I, I have taught these students, so I know that they have an understanding of what I was talking about today. But those who are not from the field, and I, uh, you know, I see Vaishali ma'am and Pramod sir and Chetna ma'am and many different uh, faculties from different fields. I hope I was able to give you a glimpse into how the different fields of, uh, you know, interdisciplinary collaborations can work in the field of uh, biology and computers. And this is one area that we can jointly explore. At GSFT and you know, the students that can be projects that can be done in this field. So, uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yeah, I would also thank all the participants for sparing their time and I hope they enjoyed this session and got to know the basics of uh, bioinformatics. You know? So with that, uh, I would say uh, that uh, please uh, do fill up all the, uh, the feedback. The feedback link is there in the chat section and uh, please do fill up that uh, feedback form and your feedback is valuable for us. So uh, with, that, with this, uh, we could end the session now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. So, uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you all for a patient hearing, and uh, continue, we continue with this webinar series. So, I hope to see you attending all the different webinars which have been arranged by the University. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.